one more. All right, there we go. All right, everybody. Thanks for your attention, your time. Again, welcome to Tabernacles Day 1. So for the next five days, Monday through Friday this week, days 2 through um, 6 of the feast, uh, 10.30 every morning, same time, we'll be here in the room. But we're going to do something a little different, though. We're going to do what we're calling apologetics workshops or symposium. Uh, and, and the reason that this is on our heart is we believe that the church has really kind of dropped the ball somewhat and people are falling by the wayside. People inside the church are falling off and people that should actually be invited into the church aren't getting invited into the church. So we want to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, what, whose responsibility that is, how that can be done, what it's really about. Uh, one thing, though, so as you saw today, uh, Brian was was encouraging people to participate more than we normally do um, in this in the sense that Brian was today. They were more rhetorical type questions like he kind of expected people would say, yes, God is good all the time. Um, we would hope, though, that if there is actually somebody in the audience who has doubts about that and wonders, I don't know if he is good all the time. That's the kind of stuff we want to hear that. Now, that may be difficult for somebody to admit in a group like this. But if somebody truly is experiencing those thoughts or they know someone secondhand who is having difficulty with that idea and they don't know how to help them, those are the kind of conversations that we need to encourage and, and understand that they are happening very often, much more often than we expect, and how to respond to them in a loving, godly way. So yes. that's kind of what, in a nutshell, what this is about. So let me go to the next slide here. It's just a few slides. So here, so the problem... Oh. What just happened there? Did it disappear up there too? It's still up there. Okay. All right. The problem that's happening here that we want to address is that friends in the church, people we know, people that you um, that you're friends with on social media, maybe and social media makes the world such a big place for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, people we know on social media that say they're Christians and yet they're having these questions, these doubts, they're having difficulty applying what God's word says in reality, in the world, they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to connect the dots. Next uh, generation. Right. The next generation. And so even, so this, even this yes, generation. Even this generation. Yes. So there's people like that that we know. There's people maybe that we encounter um, in our work that are, that are Christians that are having these doubts. And also there's probably people that are sitting in the chair next to you, whether you know it or not. There's people, if you're married, your spouse might be having these. Your children might be having these questions. And the church has spent a great deal of time focusing on other stuff and not addressing these things that that the world is pushing on them. So I've got a few things here. So we're going to we're going to cover some of the common questions that people are being confronted with today. This is what the world is pushing at the Christian or those who would become Christians. C questions that, uh, as Brian mentioned, for myself, when. I, I grew. I wasn't. I didn't grow up in any kind of church environment or Christian environment whatsoever. But I still believed there was a God. It didn't matter to me. I didn't live my life in, yeah. uh, based on that. But I believe there was a God. So, at the time of my life later on, when I began to become convicted of my own sin, I didn't have a hurdle to cross of like, well, who, what, is there a God? What is that? I didn't have that. Now after, so I was able to just take that essentially completely blindly without any evidence or any convincing because I, I wasn't intellectually burdened by any difficulty there. I wasn't. That was the grace from him. Now, after time went on and I began to go out and talk to other people and learn stuff, I would see, well, this is a valid doubt or a valid concern. And so then I had to do some more investigation to find out, well, was my initial assumption correct? And then my faith became stronger as that. Um, Brian mentioned uh, Evelyn with Levi and Hannah and there. So while they certainly understood and believed the idea that God is good, once life came in and said, all right, well, now here's a situation where it's not, you can't just say, yeah, I believe that. You're going to have to actually put your boots on the ground and figure out how to walk that out. Mm -hmm. And they had to, through prayer and support from others, learn how to do that. That's part of what we're talking about here. So these the things that are on the screen here, are some of the common things that are some of the common attacks that are being pushed at the church today. So um, how do I know God exists? That seems like maybe it's a foolish question, but it isn't. And we'll go over that. God does exist. So we want to make sure 
we don't want to raise any doubts mm -hmm. in people that we're not going to answer. Mm -hmm. But so God does exist. But the question is out there, how do I know God exists? So how do I know that the Bible is correct? Let, let me interject on yes, too. Yes. But the, how do I know God exists? It isn't just a matter of, well, I just believe. I don't have evidence. Um, I appreciate, like, there's a series of movies called God's Not Dead. And in God's Not Dead, number one, the main character who was standing up to fight for God's existence, he began his testimony saying, well, I can't prove he exists any more than you can't prove he doesn't exist. There's no evidence, but I believe. That is not the biblical approach. Romans chapter 1 tells us that people are without excuse because the evidence for the Creator is here in the things that are created. There is, There are reasons to believe God exists. There is solid evidences of Him. There's His fingerprint yes. on His creation. Yes. And so we'll delve into those type of things. Yeah, one of the most common objections um, in regards to evidence is that Evidence for God minimizes the necessity for faith. Um, that, in other words, the more reasons we have for believing in God exists, for example, the less room there is for faith. That's not true. That is a false dilemma that's been created. That's not true whatsoever. There are evidences for that. And, and while many of us might not have had that particular intellectual hurdle to get across, to be able to believe, many people today do, especially in society. Brian mentioned our America is just, they don't even pretend anymore. Mm -hmm. They don't even pretend anymore. So those are the, so another one here, you know, does science and faith, are they contradictory? Nope. Um, or is God harsh? Is he judgmental? Why does he hate people so much? Why is he so judgmental? Those are, those are certainly attacks that people who are enemies of God use to undermine the church. But they are also questions and doubts that people that actually are his may have and do have many do and some of them fall away as a result because they don't find any answers and 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 they're not necessarily in an environment that cultivates being able to ask those questions just think about um in your in your fellowship if someone was truly having doubt about well i don't know um is is it really wrong to be a homosexual if they love each other do you think that a person who was beginning to have those kind of doubts and thoughts um, could come to you and say, hey, I'm having these doubts? Honestly, I don't mean as a challenge and argument trying to debate, but just honestly, openly say, hey, and, and do you think that you could have answers for them that they hadn't already heard? Well, God says that homosexuality is an abomination. They already know that. That's true. That is well, ultimately where they need to come back. But obviously, they have other there's other things going on. So we're going to talk about this, especially on day one, about how does this pan out? Are we seen as approachable is what he's right. asking yes. there by others. Did, you know, can people place a trust in us that they could be vulnerable and say, I have a different understanding of what I think you think. Or do people think we're so that right. they're not even willing to talk to us? Right. And if it's our loved ones, that's we can't have that wall because how can we be a help to them? that they think we don't have ears to hear. I won't read through this entire set of scriptures mm -hmm. here, but just this is an example, and we'll get into more, but here's Paul, where he talks about, this is Paul's exhorting us, setting the example for us of how to be apologetic to people. And we'll, we'll talk about what apologetics is and what that all means mm -hmm. tomorrow in the first part. But here, Paul, he says, to a Jew, I became as a Jew. Um, to those under the law, I became under the law. To those without law, I became as without law. Why? So that I could gain the weak, and I do this for the gospel's sake. So we can look at this, and we'll dig into this more, but we can look at this and say, well, that was Paul. Of course, Paul did that stuff. But Paul is setting the example for us. This is how we are to be also. Now, we're not Paul. We're not supposed to be out there. Not all of us are evangelists, but all of us should be apologists. All of us should have an answer. We should be eager to give an answer when there's a vacuum that needs to be filled with the truth. Yeah. Um, just a quick snip. I, I snagged this from Ken's sermon yesterday. Um, even the color scheme kind of matches, so nice job there. I appreciate it. So, um, <laughs> but this is, again, another, another approach or another look at the way apologetics is done. These are strategies. These are things that we have to carry with us so that we can truly be a light. We have to be willing, though. It takes a disciplined 
proactive approach to be able to be a light to the world. You can't just sit in your home and expect to be a light. You can't do it, you know. So these are good things. So thanks for that, Ken. Yes, thank now, you. Good food. Yes. Still full. One, one thing that I do want to mention here is that, so there's all kinds of questions. And I don't want to sound like it's overwhelming because there's answers, says Brian. So what we want to, uh, throughout the week, we want to address some of the common things and show you some of the common ways that they can be answered. There is no pat complete answer. There, there, there are answers, but it just you have to talk with people and find out where what do they need. But we want to show some examples of how these are. It's so that ultimately, as we close each day, you will be more and more convinced that God is good all the time. Mm -hmm. That He can provide a table in the wilderness, no matter what, no matter what it seems like, no matter one of one of the things that. So the list of stuff that Brian had on the screen about. Um, these different things in these scenarios, God is still good, you know, when circumstances are going bad. Uh, one of the things also is when I have doubts about stuff that I don't seem to have an answer for. If somebody asks me a question that seems like, well, that's a pretty valid question. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know how to answer that. I don't know an answer to that. How do I answer that? You know, like, uh, like, yeah, well, God, how come God uh, endorsed slavery and he has sex slaves or whatever in the Bible? And then you look and they got a couple of verses and you're like, wow, it does kind of look like that. That seems so those kind of things, I don't know how to answer it. So even in, in light of that, to, to be able to edify and build the church up, that there are answers, even if you don't know the answers, that you can still know God is good in all those things. Mm -hmm. so, so we want to cover some of the, the larger 30,000 foot issues that are even pre preventing people from coming into the church foundational that be foundational things or things that are pulling people off the foundation. Yes. Not so much doctrinal internal stuff. Not that those things are important. So here's some examples of things that we won't be addressing during this here. These are just examples to give you an idea. So things like calendar calculations, not to say any of these aren't important, but they're not what we're talking about. Um, end time events, uh, the name usage, uh, mode of baptism. Again, a couple of these I got from, from Ken. Thank you very much. So mode of baptism, uh, worship service structure, things like those, uh, what Mosaic commands apply to new covenant believers, those kind of things, those aren't the ones that we're going to dig into and address here. Because those, for the most part, people who are having the kind of doubts we've been talking about, even if they're convinced one way or another on a calendar or whatever, it's not going to serve Just saying pulling someone off right. a rock or right. it's the more heart matters that are there. Again, belief and trust in him. So another common concern, and we're just about finished here with this intro. Another common concern is that, well, apologetics seems like um, it's just trying to, it's being, I don't know if you know the term seeker sensitive. That's a common term today. There's a lot of churches today, the big mega churches, especially they're becoming seeker sensitive. So they see, well, most of the world wants to say that homosexual marriage is okay or that abortion is okay. God says those things are not okay, and so there's a conflict there. So how do you how do you eliminate that conflict? Well, the seeker, what the seeker sensitive churches do is they change the message. Then they say, well, okay, we won't even say anything about homosexual marriage at all. Just come on in and join us. Mm -hmm. We won't say anything about abortion. That's seeker sensitive. They change the message to apply to a larger group of people. That's evil. That is Satan. That is not apologetics. If, if, if your mode of apologetics brings this about, you're doing it wrong. That's sorry. That's right. That's wrong. <laughs> that's, that's it. Yes. The apologetics. It's sorry, but it's here, not apologetics. So is not to, so that the, the heart um, would be changed to accept the message, not change the message so that the unconverted heart will accept it, but so that the heart would be changed converted. to accept the message, to be yes. converted. Correct. That's the goal of apologetics. That's what apologetics is for. It's already um, the so, offense. Yep. So it's help the offended understand that it's that it is their offense at the message that's wrong, not the message itself. To help them understand that, um, it provides godly, loving edification for those having difficulty in or coming to faith, and it's for people both inside and outside of the church. I think most people, when they hear apologetics, they think about evangelization outside the church. You're going on a street corner or whatever. Or going to the coffee shop and talking to people that's not that is a part of apologetics oh, yep. and we'll talk about that's not apologetics also is for the church for yes, people that are in so. the church also and um so for example and and just another example to show that it's not a seeker sensitive thing and it's also not a new thing it's not like oh they're talking about now going on these other topics it's new 
So just think about back in the early days after Christ's um, crucifixion and resurrection and the early days in the books, book of Acts. All of a sudden, all the Gentiles are coming in. That never had happened before. Now, the message didn't change, just as we see in Jude. He says here to exhort, you know, that you should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Nobody was ever saying change that message. But now, all of a sudden, how to walk that out? How to walk that out when you have all these Gentiles coming in and stuff? They didn't know the answers to those questions. So they had to prayerfully approach these and provide answers so that the message would stay strong and not be changed. And yet they also could address those who had objections, seemingly valid objections. So not just guffaw at them and think, you're idiots, get out of here. No, here, yes, we understand. We understand there's a difficulty here that we didn't have to address before because it wasn't an issue. And now it's an issue. And so we have, now we know how to address it. So that's the same thing. It's not changing the message whatsoever. And it's not being seeker sensitive. So I think that's very important to point out. Um, so just real quick, there'll be, like I said, five days. There's five different topics. Uh, the first day, which will be tomorrow morning, um, is kind of apologetics, why and who and where and when such thing and some examples. Uh, day two will address uh, does God exist? Some of the some of the response, some of the common challenges that have been made attacks that have been made and and ways to respond to them possible ways to respond to them. the second day or the third day will be can i trust the bible the fourth day on thursday will be faith and science are the incompatible and then the last day friday has got too judgmental or harsh so we're going to cover kind of those topics some of the common ways that the world is pressing against those and attacking christians and some responses and again as i said each day the, the plan is that at the end of the day, we'll have some more information about what's going on in the world and how to respond to it. But underneath that, we'll strengthen the foundation of the fact that we'll realize God is good all the time in spite of all these new attacks, just like I'm sure some people wondered back in the day when all the Gentiles started coming. It's like, well, what a mess now. How is this ever going to, can God provide a table in this chaos? Yes, he can. And he can provide a table in this also. So, Brian, and, and then we're going to definitely encourage much more interaction. So not just even at the level of um, like yes or no questions, but more like have you, um, are you aware of, have you encountered people who are having questions like this? Or are there other questions? We want to we want to kind of bring those things out. And we have a limited time here, unfortunately. And we only have a few days, but we want to help build people up to encourage people to foster that type of environment so they can take it back home with them as well and continue in it to grow in it and to help others grow in it. So that's uh, that's in a nutshell what we hope to do in these next five days. And we will need our Heavenly Father's help, His Spirit, the grace of His Son, and your help as well. So look forward to seeing that. And Brian, so that yeah. will be, yeah. Uh, you got anything else you'd like to? No, just uh, again that uh, I hope uh, for those you know who have known us over the years, that we have gained a, a place of trust that you can be vulnerable with us and not afraid of some harsh judgment or anything like that. As again, I try to look to God as an example of what to be, and as I see, as he, he's a father pitying his children. I am ready and open to have. Mercy on any, there's no question that's going to be too stupid. You know, it's like you think back to as a kid when you hear that in the schools, no question is too stupid. Some might want to try to push that, but it. Or take it as a challenge. Yeah, take it as a challenge. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Dave, don't try that. Um, right. no. no, but this. <laughs> no, it's, again, I just want us to be real. This, you know, um, total openness, clarity, transparency with one another because we're hurting ourselves if we have these doubts and we're not willing to lean on another brother or sister in Christ to be shorn up in these things. Ultimately, it's, it's to our hurt. Um, the body's here to edify the body. And if we don't trust the body to do it, if you're talking to people outside of the body, guess what? You're being pulled away. They're not going to shore you up. Here's the place and the time to share 
your questions and your and your doubts and your struggles, this is the place. All right? Yes. Yeah. But, and I'm right on that. And then we'll close out. Uh, often in our fellowship, when we have opportunity to sit down and talk, um, somebody might ask a question that they've been hesitant to ask. And then all of a sudden, find out, well, other people had the same question and they just were hesitant to ask. They didn't want yeah. to ask the question. Yep. So that's what we we know these kind of questions are through people's minds. So I'm looking at this group of people. I'm sure some people, and I'm going to accuse anybody specifically, but I'm sure either there are some people here that either personally are having these questions and, and don't really know, or they know someone very closely that is having these questions and challenges and they don't know how to help them and answer them. So yes. we all do want to do it for the glory of God. Amen. And this recording, Kev, buddy. <laughs>